Hello everyone, welcome back to a discussion of the IMO 2022. In this video, we will be discussing the day 2 problems as well as the statistics of all the problems. Without further ado, let us take a look at problem 4. So we finally have the geometry problem and this is the only geometry problem of this year. So let ABCD be a convex pentagon such that BC equals to DE. Assume that there is a point T inside the pentagon such that TB equals TD and TC equals TE and ABT equals TEA. Now, let the line AB intersect CD at P and AB intersect the line CT at Q. Assume that the order of the points are P, B, A, Q in this order. Next, let the line AE, which is here, intersect CD at R and the line AE intersects DT at S. And again, assume the points are in order R, E, A, S. Now we need to prove that P, S, Q, R lie on a circle. Okay, sounds like an interesting problem. It turns out that the solution involves uh, quite, a, quite a fair bit of angle chasing and uh, basic concyclic properties. So actually it's not very sophisticated, which makes it a suitable problem for. Let us take a look at the solution. Now, the first thing from the conditions on equal lengths, you can very quickly tell that triangle DET is actually uh, congruent to triangle BCT. So this is quite evident from the equal sides. So this gives that this angle between the blue and red side is equal to the other angle between the blue and red side. So this is the first observation. Now let us take a look at the triangles BTQ and the triangles uh, EST. It turns out that they are similar and this is quite easy to spot as well. Firstly, the green angles are equal. Secondly, the angle uh, at T is 180 minus purple and the other angle at T is also 180 degrees minus purple. So we have two equal angles and the two triangles are similar. What this gives is that this red angle and this red angle, they are equal to each other. Okay. Let's look at the pair of similar triangles again. There's one more piece of information we need to extract. So because of the similar triangles, the ratio TQ over TB is equal to the ratio TS over TE. Now I cross multiply across, I get TQ times TE equals TS times TB. And now let us remember that TB is equal to T TD and TE is remember the TC is equal to TC. So if you make that substitution, we get TQ times TC equals TS times TD. And what does that give us? This gives us that QSCD is consecutive because T is a point inside and then you have the power of the point theorem. So now that we have this is concyclic, it gives us that this angle, this gray angle is equal to this gray angle here. So nothing sophisticated and here's the finishing blow. Uh, angle QSR is the gray angle minus the red angle. And angle QPR is also the gray angle minus the red angle because this gray angle is the sum of this red and this angle here. So this angle minus this will give you this angle QPR equals gray minus red as well. So now that we have gray minus red equals gray minus red, this concludes the proof that these four points QSPR, they are concyclic. So what do you think of problem four? Uh, it's a long string of angle trading and uh, small observations that are not too sophisticated. So hopefully you are, uh, you managed to enjoy problem four. And the cool story is I heard that this problem was actually invented by an AI uh, artificial intelligence program. So not sure about the details, but if you comment in the comment section below, I'm sure someone will be able to give further details. Okay, so that's for problem four. And now let us take a look at problem five. So for problem five, we have a number theory problem. We are supposed to find all triplet, triplets, triplets, uh, ABP of 
positive integers with p prime such that a to the power of p equals b factorial plus p. So very interesting uh, looking equation here with factorial and power and primes. Now, what happens is for this problem, it turns out that the proof is basically a, again, a very long string of uh, many, many small observations. So it may seem a bit tedious, but actually uh, this makes the problem approachable yet <laughs> tedious. So let's take a look at uh, the solution. But before doing that, I guess a bit of uh, brainstorming to motivate uh, what we are going to do. So one of the first things I tried when looking at a problem is I felt tempted to consider the case b bigger than equals to p and see whether this brings us anywhere. Because, well, if b is bigger than equal to p, then b factorial contains p, right? So the right hand side is divisible by p and therefore it greatly constrains the left hand side. Uh, we must have p divides a. Once you have p divides a, I think this is enough evidence that maybe this uh, track of reasoning can greatly constrain the possibilities of a and therefore b and p. But more on this later, uh, this is just a very quick motivation to explain why we consider uh, two cases. So the first case we will consider is b less than p. Okay, now uh, let's break down into 1a and 1b because each of them is individually easier to solve. If a is less than or equal to b, that's for the first half of the case. Now, if a is less than or equal to b, let's look at the equation. If a is tiny, then b will contain a, right? So, I mean, b factorial will contain a. So a divides uh, this, a divides b factorial. So a must divide p, which forces a equals to one because a is smaller than p. So you'll see this team where you, Recur, uh, later on in the problem as well, where you small number end up with divide b factorial and then it constrains what the small number can be. So uh, anyway, a is equal to 1. And so we must have 1 equals b factorial plus p, but p is at least 2, so there's definitely no solution here. Okay, now what happens if a is large? And you'll see this team again uh, later on in the proof. If a is large, intuitively, this left hand side we will be bigger than the right hand side and it's quite intuitive because uh p is also bigger than b right so you have man many copies of a which is larger than b and so many copies of a larger number is definitely bigger than lesser copies of a smaller number so this suggests that uh, a proof along this line will work so let's take a look at the proof now what we'll do is we'll show uh, a to the p minus p is bigger than b factorial. So to do this, a to the p minus p, uh, basically a is bigger than or equal to b plus 1. So we have this. And then we use uh, the binomial expansion, but only keeping the first term and the last two terms. So this is again greater than or equal to this. And now um, what we have is b is at least 1. So PB is at least P, which cancels the P here. And then one is strictly bigger than zero. So we end up with strictly bigger than B, P. And of course, uh, P is bigger than B, right? So you have P copies of B here, whereas B factorial is uh, B times B minus one and so on until one. You have only B copies of numbers, which are at most B. So this inequality holds. So indeed, we've shown left-hand side bigger than right-hand side, but actually, there's, this is just a lot of algebra to prove something that is quite intuitively clear. So, for case 1b, there's also no solution. So, we're done with case 1. And now, let us consider case 2, which is slightly longer, uh, but again, it's about a string of small observations. Okay, b bigger than equal to p. We previously saw that this implies uh, p divides right-hand side, so p divides a. Okay. Now, the next thing is we use this to show that b cannot be bigger than or equal to 2p. Why is that so? Well, uh, otherwise, what happens is uh, we move the b square over. We have uh, p divides here, right? And p is at least 2. So there's at least a copy of p square inside here. And if b is at least 2p, there'll be two copies of p inside the factorial. So then p square will divide this as well. And then p square will divide this thing which is equal to p, uh, a contradiction. 
So we must have the factorial containing only one copy of p, namely that b is between p to 2p minus 1 inclusive. And now we use this fact back to uh, make a new observation about a. Now, let us now write a as a multiple of p. What we want to show is that actually a must be equal to p. It cannot be any larger multiple of p. And to do this, we break into two cases. Again, similar to what we saw earlier on. Now, if a is a small multiple of p, namely that k is strictly between 1 and p, then what happens is that, let's look at this equation. k is featured here. k is featured here as well because k is less than p, which is less than or equal to b. So k is featured here. This means k divides p. And um, since k is between 1 and p, there is no solution. On the other hand, if k is larger than or equal to p, in other words, a is bigger than or equal to p squared, then again, we are going to show that the left-hand side is bigger than the right-hand side. So very similar idea as before. Uh, the algebra is uh, as follows. So we have start with the right-hand side, b factorial plus p. Uh, we've shown that b is at most 2p minus 1, so it's uh, inequality here. And now what we do is we pair up the terms in the factorial. Uh, we take out p and then we pair p minus 1 with p plus 1, p minus 2 with p plus 2 and so on. So we have this uh, rewriting of the factorial. We pull out the common factor of p. And with this rewriting, this term actually is p squared minus j squared. And the reason why we do this is because each of these is less than p squared. So what we have is, uh, firstly, the j equals 1 term, we get exactly p squared minus 1 plus 1. Uh, so we have uh, the p squared. And then the rest of the uh, things in the product are strictly less than p squared. So it's very easy to check that this thing is less than or equal to p squared to the power of p minus 1. So we have this. And this thing together is only 2p minus 1 copies in the power. So it's strictly less than p to the 2p. In other words, this thing uh, is a to, our, to the power of p. So uh, again, left hand side bigger than right hand side, there's no solution. So what we have just shown is that a must equal to p. So we are left to prove, uh, consider the case where p to the power of p equals b factorial plus p, and b is between p and 2p minus 1. Okay, so at this stage, uh, maybe we try a few uh, tiny cases first. If p equals 2, you plug in p, uh, 4 equals b factorial plus 2, b factorial must be 2. So we have the solution a equals p equals b equals 2. If we put in p equals 3, we have 27 equals b factorial plus 3, so b factorial is 24. So we have a equals p equals 3 and b equals 4. So for the rest of the solution, we are going to assume p is greater than or equal to 5. And we are going to show that there's actually no solution. Uh, at this point, most of the solutions on the AOPS forum actually uses this thing called lifting the exponent lemma. Uh, I've done a video on the LTE lemma before, which you can check out uh, on my channel. But if you don't know this lemma, it might be a bit hard to uh, follow. So Instead, what I'm going to do is show you an alternative proof that doesn't use the LTE. Okay, to do this proof, we break into two cases. I mean, very quickly, we can check that B uh, equals P will have no solution. And this is very simply by checking that P to the power of P is always bigger than P factorial plus P from uh, P equals 5 onwards. Uh, this is just direct checking. So B is at least P plus 1 from now on. Okay. And the crux of the proof is to realize that inside the b factorial, since b is at least p plus 1, it has the term p plus 1. It has the term p plus 1 over 2, and it has the term 2. And these are all distinct for p uh, at least 5. Because p at least 5 means this is at least 3. So this term and the 2 are distinct. So you have this divides p factor, uh, b factorial, which means that p plus 1 square divides b factorial. So if there were to be a solution, we need p plus 1 square to divide p to a p minus p. The question is, does this hold? Well, we can factorize p to a p minus p. Firstly, pull out the common factor of p. Second, uh, fact, fact, because p minus 1 is uh, even, we can write this as p squared minus 1 uh, times the geometric progression here. So, and then p squared minus 1 can be factorized as uh, p plus 1 times p minus 1. So the question is, 
if I cancel out the P plus one, uh, one copy of P plus one, then does the remaining copy of P plus one divide the rest of the factors, P, P minus one, and the, this string here. Now, clearly P and P plus one are co-prime. So we can just drop the P and ask, does P plus one divide this uh, product here? Okay, let's investigate. What is this string here, modulo P plus one? Well, P mod P plus one is minus one, right? So this thing uh, is minus one squared. So what we have is one plus one plus one plus one plus one, uh, and there's p minus one over two terms. So this string is actually congruent to p minus one over two mod p plus one. So actually we are already done. Uh, but to make make it very explicitly clear why we are done, uh, the easiest way is to realize that p plus one is even, p minus one is even. So I can cancel out the copy of two in each of these and ask. Does p plus one over two divide p minus one over two times this string? Uh, clearly this is one less than this. They are adjacent numbers actually. So this is congruent minus one. This and the string here we've shown that is congruent to this mod p plus one, which means it's congruent to the same thing mod p plus one over two, uh, which is minus one. So this whole thing is actually congruent to one mod this thing. So no, the answer is no. Uh, there's, it doesn't divide, so there's no solution. So, uh, that is all for problem five. Uh, yeah, it's indeed a string of small observations, and I hope uh, you found the problem interesting nonetheless. Okay, let us now take a look at problem six. So, for problem six, we have a combinatorics problem. Let n be a positive integer. A nordic square is a n by n board containing all the integers from 1 to n square so that each cell contains exactly one number. So over here we have 1 to 25 uh, filled up in a 5 by 5 square. Two different cells are considered adjacent if they share a common site. Okay. And each cell that is adjacent only to cells containing larger numbers is called a valley. So for example, 2 here is a valley because uh, the up, down, left, right are all bigger than it, the number. Okay, an uphill path is a sequence of one or more cells such that firstly the sequence starts at a valley. Subsequent steps are basically between adjacent cells, so like this for example. And then the numbers returned the cells in the sequence are in an increasing order. So uh, we have the example in green here. Note that the uphill path need not land at a peak. So actually here for example, we could have continue the path uh, by moving from 10 to 12, and this will give a new uphill path. Yeah. So what we are supposed to find as a function of n is the smallest possible total number of uphill paths in a Nordic square. Okay. So this is actually a really interesting problem. Um, let us take a look at the solution. What we will show you is that uh, 2n times n minus 1 plus 1 is a lower bound. And this lower bound is actually not hard to show. The harder part is the construction. What we will do to show the lower bound is to show that I can map each pair of adjacent cells to a different uphill path. So what do I mean by this? Uh, let us say we have a pair of adjacent cells here. And uh, for the sake of uh, concreteness, let's say a is uh, less than b, so we have the adjacent cells pointing this way. Now if a is a valley, I'm done and I'm going to call it, uh, this my uphill path that that uh, ends in a, b. If a is not valley, that means there's at least one of the other squares that are strictly less than it. So I pick any one of them, and now I have a new uh, square that I'm at. If that's the valley, I'm done. If that's not a valley, I can keep going down and down and down and down until I end up at a valley. So once I end up at a valley, I will call that the uphill path that is determined by uh, the pair of adjacent cells uh, A and B. Okay. Why does this procedure give distinct uphill paths for different pair of adjacent cells? 
Well, quite simply, the uphill path I construct will have that pair of adjacent cells as the last two cells. So if I have different pairs, they'll have different uphill paths because it, I mean, the, the ending cells are different. So how many pair of adjacent cells are there? Well, going uh, horizontally, there's uh, n minus one each row and n rows. So there's n times n minus one. And then going vertically, there's another n times n minus one. So this already gives two n times n minus one different uphill paths. And then lastly, the single cell one will contribute a length one uphill path. Cause the cell one definitely is up, down, left, right neighbors are strictly bigger than it. Okay. So this is definitely the minimum number of uphill paths is a lower bound. And now the tricky part is we need to construct a Nordic square that has only this number of uphill paths. Okay, before we go into the construction and the proof, I'll give a bit of a motivational uh, talk on how we uh, get towards the construction. So let's think about what are the features that we want in the construction so that it saturates the bound. The bound clearly we argued through a certain way uh, in the previous slide. Uh, one of the first things definitely is that if we want to saturate the bound, then we must have one as the only value. If there's some other single cell that is uh, it, the only value, it will clearly already bust our bound. And then thinking how we constructed the, the bound earlier on, it means that actually for any pair of cells, right, the procedure, there must be only one way in which we end up with an uphill path. And for this to happen, it means that for every pair of adjacent cells, at each step, there must only be one downwards uh, option. So it's either a valley or it's either at already the cell one as a valley. If not, we go downwards, right? And if there are multiple options, again, we are already uh, bust our bound. To be exactly tight at the bound, it means that at each step, there's only exactly one downward option. And then the next cell, there's exactly only one downward option all the way until we reach the only value one. Let's think what this means in terms of graph. If we convert each cell into a vertex and we draw a directed edge from a lower cell to a, a higher cell that is adjacent to it, so for, for each adjacent pair of uh, uh, cells, we draw a directed edge from the lower to the upper number. What we are trying to uh, require from our resultant graph is the following. We cannot have a situation like this where uh, we have a adjacent pair of cells. And then when we look at the lower number, and start going downwards, there are actually, there's actually branch points for us to choose multiple options. So in this case, for example, we cannot have this con uh, construction cause this is an adjacent pair of cells. But when we go downwards immediately, there's already two different options of going to the valley. So that will give two different uphill paths that ends up at this uh, adjacent pair of squares. Then that will surely bust our bound already. Now note that it is okay to have branch points if actually V is a sink, meaning it has no uh, outward bound edges. Because think about again, the thing we try to prevent so that we don't bust our bound. This, this pair here is a pair of adjacent uh, cells, but what I want is only from looking at the lower cell and start going down onwards, there is only one path. I don't care about the upper cell having more than one path because this other path corresponds to another pair of adjacent cell at its uh at its top at its end so th this configuration is perfectly okay so if we think about it what we want is actually we want the resultant graph to be a tree uh if we restrict ourselves to non sinks so a graph like this will work uh, we don't care about uh, sinks. Sinks are perfectly fine to have multiple uh, downward branch paths, but the rest of the graph should form a tree. So for example, if I look at uh, this pair 
of adjacent cells as the uh as the as the starting point then when i start going down there's only one way to the uh root because this rest of the tree I, this rest of the graph i constructed it to be a tree similarly if i look at this random uh pair of adjacent cell when i look at the lower number and start going downwards there's only one path to the root so uh what we want is one is the only root of the tree and uh the graph has this feature so again this is just a motivational uh segment but once we know we want to do something like this it pretty much uh, points you towards the desired construction so let us take a look at the actual construction and the proof of why it works what we want to do is we want to shape t cells such that the following two conditions hold uh, firstly if we draw uh, undirected edges between every adjacent uh, shaded cells the resulting graph is a tree so for example uh, this if we focus on just the shaded uh, cells here you can quickly see that actually uh, using uh, edges between drawing edges between adjacent cells we actually have a tree here and then the second condition we want to hold is that all unshaded cells are surrounded only by shaded cells so for example this cell only has shaded cells around it and why would we be done once we have this shading pattern well what we are going to do is we are going to pick arbitrary an arbitrary shaded cell and fill in one and then we are going to expand outwards uh, from that shaded cell to fill up the rest of the shaded cell in order of visit up to t uh, so for example if i put one here then i can put two here three here four here and five here then i continue to expand outwards then i put six here then seven eight uh, nine and so on so uh, basically you can if you want to be fancy you can say you are using breakfast or deficits to fill the shaded cell in order of visit uh, in the order one two three four five and so on but if you want to use a more layman way to describe basically write the number one somewhere in a shaded cell and then for each uh, unfilled shaded cell that has a adjacent um, cell that's already filled up by a number we fill up with the next available number yeah so uh, think of it as having one and then it permeates outwards starting from that cell until it fills up all the shaded cell with numbers and then for the unshaded cell we are just going to put in the rest of the numbers t plus one until n square in an arbitrary manner now let us check that there is only that uh bound number of uh, uphill paths firstly the only uphill path of length one is the cell one this is quite clear because uh, for any other number it was only filled in because uh, if it's a black cell it is only filled in after a smaller number next to it has been filled in so it cannot be a valley if it's a white cell it is uh, all next to black cells right and white cell numbers are all bigger than black cell numbers so this first bullet is true now for the second bullet i claim that uh, for all uphill paths we can obviously just look at the last two cells so this creates a map from uphill paths to pairs of adjacent cells and i claim that this mapping is injective why is it so firstly the mapping cannot lead to two white cells because there are no two white cells that are adjacent so if the mapping leads to a white cell and a black cell uh, because the white cell numbers are all bigger than black cell numbers the lower part of the uh, two adjacent cells is a black cell and the black cells form a tree uh, so the only there's only one path downwards from the black cell all the way to the valley one so uh, this shows that uh, this subcase now if the two last cells are both black cells again uh, one of them is a lower number and there's only one way in a tree from that black cell down to the root uh, which is the the number one so uh, this proves that this mapping is injective and therefore there can only be uh, 
as many uphill paths as there are adjacent pair of cells. So this actually proves uh, that the bound is tight. So the last thing we need to do is to construct the shading in a way that fulfills what we described. We have black cells forming a tree and no two white cells are adjacent. And shown here is a pattern for n equals 9. For multiples of 3, we can simply extend the pattern leftwards and upwards. So we extend leftwards, uh, for, uh, we copy this thing here next, then copy this thing here next, and so on. Uh, extending upwards is quite straightforward, and we repeat this pattern. So multiples of 3, no problem. And then for non-multiples of 3, we look at the uh, next multiple of 3 higher than that. We form that number first. So for example, if uh, n is 7, we form the 9 by 9 pattern first. Then what we can do is uh, we can cut off one column, the leftmost column and the top column to get uh, 8. And then we can cut off the rightmost column and then the top column again to get 7. So for all non-multiples of 3, form the multiple of 3 version. Cut the left and top. If need to, cut the right and top again. So that is all for the construction. And I would like to credit uh, this user on AOPS for this uh, construction. It's very elegant and easy to describe. So that is all for problem 6. And now let us take a look at the statistics of all the problems this year. I covered problems 1 to 3 earlier uh, in the previous video. And for problems 4 to 6, it turns out that they are uh, only slightly behind in uh, compared to problems 1 to 3. So this is typical of a day 2 distribution, which is around day 1 but slightly more difficult. But what is interesting is that actually uh, the problems this year in general are actually a lot uh, more accessible than 2021. 2021 last year was uh, quite a murderous paper. Uh, P2 was crazy. Even P4 was not that uh, accessible compared to P4 this year. Uh, but interestingly, P6 this year turns out to be harder. So. Maybe, I mean, it's actually really hard to uh, convince yourself to do the construction if you're not 100% sure that the bound is tight. I mean, if I told you that the bound is true, it, it's pretty natural to try and see when the bound is saturated and therefore go down the route of the explanation I gave. But during the contest, no one's going to tell you that your bound is indeed the tight one. So that, that can be really tricky to solve during contest. So. What do you think of uh, this year's IMO? Comment in the comment section below. Stay tuned to the channel for more Olympiad problems and see you soon.